Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm Norma Levy, and I'm the founder and president of New Plaza Cinema. Today, we're looking forward to a lively discussion about that 1980 film, Atlantic City, directed by Louis Malle and starring Burt Lancaster and Susan Sarandon. And now I'm pleased to introduce our host for this talk back, the author and film enthusiast, Max Alvarez. Max, please begin. Thank you so much, Norma. I had spoken on Louis Mal this past Wednesday for New Plaza Cinema Online, and we're very excited to have today's event in connect coordination with that talk with that discussion on Mal, his film Atlantic City. And to start things, I want to, I'm very happy that Gary Palmucci is joining us today. He looks very ominous, you'll notice. It's a very, almost a, a neo-noir lighting. That's because Gary is joining us from the projection room at our fabulous new 35 West 67th Street Cinema at Macaulay College. Gary, welcome back. And uh, we hope the screening is going well. Max, th thank you very much. The screening is going well. We, we haven't had any film breaks or... Uh... Uh, uh, blown real changes or anything because that's not how it that's not how it goes anymore in the movie business or our movie business anyway. But I'm I'm very happy to be able to join you guys today. It's going to look a little odd, but hopefully I'll be audible and, and coherent uh, to celebrate a favorite film of mine from uh, Louis Mal, a director with one of the most I think remarkably eclectic bodies of work in, in modern movie history, spanning spanning four decades before being tragically cut short by a fatal illness and encompassing work in both France and Hollywood, features, documentaries, television work, often, often uh, daring subject matter. Mal had a tendency never to repeat himself. And yeah, there are elements of comedy that, that are recognizable in a lot of Mal's work, but every film was, was radically different than the one beforehand. And Atlantic City, came out just two years after his first real Hollywood film came out, Pretty Baby, which could not be more different than this film. Well, Max, I think the story of how Atlantic City came to be made, and I, I was, I think I cut myself off there for a moment, but I want to just salute some of his other classics briefly, like Elevator to the Gallows, the documentary Phantom India, Murmur of the Heart, La Combe Lucienne, and uh, of course, Atlantic City with, with career peak work by Burt Lancaster and, and Susan Sarandon, but this is kind of a zany story how this picture got made. I, I, I suspect you have some background on it. Just a, br a brief one. Uh, apparently it began when Louis Mal, he had been doing some documentaries for, for public television, received a Canadian tax shelter. And this, this, the agreement was, or the guarantor was that he could choose any film he wanted to make just as long as it was made within the next six months. So he had six months to pull this project together and he immediately contacted the playwright, John Guo. John, uh, John uh, you know, we were just informed by Dan that we've been yes. mispronouncing, mispronouncing Mr. Gare, Mr. Gare's name for 42 years now in, in, in talking about this movie. He, so John, he, John Gare, who... Yes. He, We'll talk more about him. But I think she was a friend of Susan Sarandon. And also there was this weird, you know, these weird stipulations that the film had to be called Atlantic City. It had to be set in Atlantic City as it was just opening up as a gambling uh, palace in the fourth quarter of 1979. I had a friend who was there on opening night. I remember this vividly. And the film had to be finished shooting by December 31st, 1979 on a very tight, tight schedule. So almost like one of the zany crime capers that going wrong in the film or something, although in this case, it went beautifully right. And I think at this point, shall we take a look at the original trailer for Atlantic City, Paramount Pictures, which had done some business with Mal's previous film, Pretty Baby, acquired Atlantic City, uh, which was a Canadian French co-production. And here is how it was sold when it finally opened in 1981 in commercial. Atlantic City. It will change every idea you ever had about winning and losing. You looked. You spilled your drink. No, 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 you took your eyes up. You allow me to distract you. Do 
teach me stuff? Susan Sarandon. Like what? She has the ambition. What you know. Bert Lancaster has the experience. I'll think about it. Just hand him this. I'll wait outside. Hey, you ain't trying to set me up now, are you? I'm trusting you. I left a fortune in your apartment. What are you talking about? Please. Please. Alone, they might not make it. Together, they might not survive. Because they're betting their lives on one big score. This guy beat me up for my help! Oh, you go! Let go of me! Tell those hoods to leave the women alone. But they're looking for Ida. I watch you. What do you do when you watch me? Hey, Foxy Grandpa. I look at you. You take off your blouse, and then you run the water. You open a box of blue soap, and you take the soap in your hands. It's over now. I want the money. Give me the money. You run your hands under the water to feel the temperature. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Give me the money. Now. Then you take a bottle of gold perfume, and you... You saved my life. The money. Money, money, money. <laughs> A room for me and my mother. Glad to see your born again. Bert Lancaster. Anyone ever take care of you like I did? You feel safe. Susan Sarandon. Yes. Atlantic City. For everyone who's ever needed one more chance. And that's how it was originally sold. Not completely inaccurate, I suppose, but I think. Uh... Missing the kind of, I call it a lethal fairy tale aspect of the of the film that, that I think is most memorable to us today. They're selling it like a kind of standard crime melodrama, and of course all that stuff happens. But and and several key bits of business are revealed which shouldn't be. But uh, that was the Paramount trailer department. Well, it's a difficult movie to classify at times because there is this gritty crime element to it, but then there's this quirky character study with with a lot of major humor running through it and we can talk more about the structure of the film but there is a lot of there are a lot of cases where they're shifting from the Burt Lancaster Susan Sarandon scenes cutting back to uh, Kate Reed back at the apartment with Hollis McLaren as uh, Susan's sister. It's like comic relief and then going back to the Burt intrigue. There's a lot of different tones, several different tones, sometimes clashing. Well, I, I like, I kind of like that expression. I didn't, I didn't originate it. Uh, lethal fairy tale. Uh, that, that's, that, that seems to kind of suit the, suit the tone of a little bit, but it's a tricky tone. It's, it's not easy to sell. I, and I think Paramount released this. It was probably a favor to somebody who had done some business with the studio before. And it was unlike a lot of these pictures that were made in Canada or with Canadian money at the time, most of which are notoriously not good. There's one or two that get shown or remembered these days, like The Changeling with George C. Scott, kind of a semi-classic horror film. Um, and we see, I think one of the, the, the good things we see about it in hindsight is it became, because of the Canadian money, there's an expression that I learned uh, uh, called CanCon or Canadian content, where there had to be X number of Canadian uh, actors or technical people uh, associated with the film for it to get made. And the cinematographer, a guy named Richard uh, Siupko, I think does a very good job with the film. And also the supporting cast, including people like Hollis McLaren, who was in a kind of cult movie called Outrageous, some of you may remember from the late 70s. Uh, Robert Joy, a hardworking actor, still, still working hard. Kate Reed. Al Waxman is Burt Lancaster's old buddy. All Canadian uh, players of one sort or another. And Robert Joy, who's the something of the loser, uh, the loser who gets killed by the mob. He came to prominence later in 1981 when Paramount released Milos Forman's Ragtime because he played Harry K. Thaw, who shot and killed the architect Sanford White. That was when I first became aware of Robert Joy. Played by Norman Mailer in the film, as I recall. That's right. Norman Mailer played that part. And Kate Reed was a British-born Canadian actress. Uh, she had done some work for some prominent directors, like Sidney Pollack. She was in 
his film of this property is condemned. She appeared in Sidney Lumet's Equus. Uh, she was in Volker Schlondorf's TV remake of Death of a Salesman four or five years after she made Atlantic City. Those were the, the high points. And then in the trailer, I guess they had to get some plug in for France. We have Michel Piccoli as the casino supervisor, really, who's trying to train Susan Sarandon. He yes. is going to, yeah, go ahead. I, I love Piccoli's performance in this film, struggling with his English and at the same time trying to teach Susan Sarandon French. I think that's kind of a, you know, a, a, one of the quintessential ironies of the story. It is. And then later in the 1980s, Piccoli will be starring in Louis Malle's last uh, French production, uh, May Fools or Melou et Mai, uh, which is a very underrated political comedy taking place in 1968. But by yes. this time, uh, Pico Lee, who had something like two, over 240 acting credits, it's quite remarkable, had already appeared for director Jean-Pierre Melville, Louis Bunuel in The Discreet Charm, and he appeared in Godard's Contempt. Very impressive. And even Susan Sarandon is going to end up with over 160 credits as an actress. I once had the, 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 the great, special graceful moment of sitting in a theater at the Cannes Film Festival and Mr. Piccoli came down and just sat down next to me with some kind of, uh, you know, gracefulness. This is about 20 years after the making of, of Atlantic City, but he still had that, uh, that, you know, that inexpressible something or other that he, that he had for his entire career. I remember when Film Forum did a Michel Piccoli retrospective a number of years ago. It's a fascinating, memorable figure. The urgency that went into the production of Atlantic City also, although I don't think this was this was tied into the they're getting the funding for it, but there was a sense of urgency in that they really had to capture this transitional Atlantic City before it was being bulldozed beyond recognition. And the images that we have for me, are the bulldozer that's across the street from the decaying apartment building where Lou lives. We see the bulldozer getting ready for, for more destructive work. The footage they showed in the trailer was clearly newsreel, or, or, or shall we say news footage of one of those magnificent hotels being dynamited during the awful transition. Well, that's, and, and according to our good friends in Wikipedia, the, the, the hotel that we see being spectacularly dynamited in the beginning of the film was actually destroyed in 1972, several, several years before the, uh, uh, the more current stuff was, was taken down there. But it's such a beautiful shot, they couldn't resist using it, I think. And in a way, this is a, almost a continuation of a film that had been made that same year in 1972, The, the King of Marvin Gardens, which uh, deals with the, Atlant the Atlantic City before this new transition take takes place. But clearly, Mall needed to capture Atlantic City in this 1979-1980 period, because in a ver few very short years, it would be not recognizable as the gritty Yes, the the Location. Trump the Trump Taj Mahal and many others of its kind were were, were built uh, uh, not long after. It's kind of amazing to think that in 1964 the Democratic National Convention was held in Atlantic City uh, when uh, John, uh, LBJ was you know nominated and and but when Hubert Humphrey is his vice president, it seems like a very unlikely spot based on the films that we that we see of it. You know, not not long after that period. And then. Absolutely, absolutely. And so you have this, this, I remember when I, when I saw Atlantic City for the first time in an advanced screening with a friend of mine, on the way out, he said, ah, Atlantic City, the Hollywood filmmakers, Venice, Italy. Uh, it, it's just this, <laughs> it's this haunting location that sir, can serve all different kinds of narratives. And this film in particular makes an outstanding use of the, of the locations which I'm sure were not, many of which were not gonna be around in a few very short years. I guess if, if you know, looking back at Louis Miles' career now, how do we, are there any common threads running through his films or any certain kinds of characters that we often see? I think, I think we could say that we often see kind of, you know, desperate characters of one sort or another or dreamers or people being unlucky in love or at the end of their rope in life, like Maurice Rene and the fire within or, uh, Jean-Paul Belmondo and the Thief of Paris, or the, 
the unfortunate young man in Lacombe Lucienne. Uh, maybe that's that's an argument you can make. Absolutely, I think that's a brilliant observation. I think despite the fact that the genre may change, whether it's a romantic film, whether it's a character study, whether it's an action adventure, because he did make Viva Maria, one of my favorites of his. Uh, With some whether, Buster Keaton-esque uh, gags and action sequences in that film, it's definitely worth exactly. a Exactly. Or even whether it's a slapstick comedy like Zazie dans le Metro or, or these, these very intense films that you mentioned like Le Clome de Lucien, I think that is the recurring theme. He either, he can, he's touched on the perils of the bourgeoisie in Murmur of the Heart and also in uh, The Lovers, his breakout film with Jean Moreau, but he also touches on those in the lower economic echelons in the other films that you mentioned, including, of course, this one. These are not the most remarkable movies. documentary. I'm sorry, Max, go ahead. Oh, no, please continue. The most remarkable of his documentaries, I think, if, if you have the patience and the interest, is it's called Phantom India. And I believe six or seven episodes about India in the late 60s when he filmed it. I think he was kind of at, kind of at uh, sixes and sevens with his career, and he ex accepted a commission from the BBC kind of on short notice and went there and shot you know, hours and hours of footage and made a beautiful, and it's, it's out there available, I think on Criterion and other uh, sources. And you have this sense that he's like kind of observing everything like a, uh, uh, a fly on the wall or some other creature being India. And, and you have a sense, that the emotions in a lot of his films, you have the sense that he's catching these on the fly or he's catching them from some, from some clandestine space and something extra is being revealed or he's pulling that out of the, of the audience at, at the performances rather. I think you see that with, with Lancaster and Sarandon here and Jean Moreau and Elevator of the Gallows, we, we could go on and on. When he was being interviewed by Wallace Shawn, who co-starred in My Dinner with Andre, I think the I think the film was called My Dinner with Louis, with Louis, I should say, he told Shawn that he approached Atlantic City as a documentary and My Dinner with Andre as a narrative film. He, th he said, My Dinner with Andre looks like a documentary, but it was carefully scripted and care yes. meticulously rehearsed. It had to be. It, it had to be. And then M M Atlantic City, because of that time constraint you had mentioned, they, he felt he was a little more free form in, how a lot, in, lot, in his approach to the direction of that narrative, something we don't associate with this kind of a genre picture. And those two pictures were released in America and in New York in the same year. That was kind of a kind of a career high point for him. Atlantic City and, and My Dinner with Andre. Not, not a bad year for a filmmaker. Not, not a bad year. And also, I was reminded, Gary, when you were making those recent, those, just the comments a few minutes ago about Maul, he was in a constant state of reinvention as a director. He would go through periods of, of, of considerable commercial success and then become very frustrated and then he would depart and go off and do do and go to do some documentaries. Then he would come back with another couple of commercial films. And then he reached the point where he went off to India to make Phantom India, which he said changed his life. He put himself in a voluntary exile from the French film industry. But then after doing the India project, he returned to narrative films again in the, in the 70s right. for a while. And, and then after the, this great year that you mentioned of my dinner with Andre and, and Atlantic City, he had two very bad experiences in Hollywood making right. Crackers and Alamo Bay. Alamo Bay, I think, is, is more interesting than its, its reputation warrants. But out of frustration with that, he then went into exile again, this time back to France where he made Au revoir les enfants. So there was constant reinvention going on. Well, I'm sure that he didn't intend it to be his last film, but I think he, he went out uh, with, with that beautiful uh, uh, Vanya on 42nd Street, which uh, perhaps isn't as well known as it should be, but I'm sure it can be, can be accessed. A very dignified finale. Now, in terms of Atlantic City, who do we, at what stage are these actors in their careers? Uh, Susan Sarandon, I mean, she's been making movies for 10 years, starting with Joe. That's right. Uh, and she has, is she's going to end up making films. Of course, it seems as though once the 80s kick in is when she's going to work for bigger directors like Louis Mal. She'll work for Ridley Scott and Tony Scott and Paul, 
Paul Schrader in the 90s and uh, Sidney Lumet. Uh, in, well, she did some work with him in the 70s. So she is, you know, she's in her mid 30s when, when Atlantic City comes out. Burt Lancaster, he's made some mediocre pictures in the in the 70s. There were a few exceptions, but this is really something of a comeback opportunity for him. I think I, I think uh, Lancaster maybe had about another decade of work, uh, but this this is I think this is in him, and, and this I think I remember seeing him in a film about the hijacking of the Achille Lauro. That might even have been his last film or something very close to it in, in 1990. And he seems to be very frail and uh, uncertain of himself, but it kind of gives a a very uh, heart running performance as Leon Klinghoffer, you know, the, the tragic American yes. tourist in a wheelchair. On the on the Achille Lauro, and it's a silly film in some ways. There's somebody playing President Reagan in it, or whatever, and other stuff. But uh, there's a, there's kind of a pathos to to Lancaster because you can see he's kind of getting to the end of his of his working life, and yet there's he's 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 dignifying dignifying that moment. Which brings us to his role as Lou in this film. It's in in some ways it's not a typical Lancaster role because he's uh, he's. To not technically an anti-hero because it turns out he's not really a hitman. I, he he claims when he after he offs those two mob men that he never killed anybody in his life before that time. Just despite that speech to Robert Joy, which is maybe my favorite scene in the film, where they're walking along the boardwalk and he's telling him some story about how he bumped off some guys from from Meyer Lansky, and then Robert Joy, Joy says, "You really did you really work for them?" And he says, "Well, you work for the people who work for the people." And then look at Atlantic City now. And now it's also goddamn legal. Tutti Frutti and craps don't mix. And then he would talk about when he would, you know, he would kill somebody, he'd swim way out to sea. He had to like cleanse himself and then come back in. Just just a beautiful uh, monologue or, or a conversation that to me, to me, I think it's still the high point of the movie. And I'm sure some of our uh, viewers will will share theirs with us. And I think Dan's gonna share some of his high points as well here very soon. Absolutely. Before I bring Dan in, I was reminded of another wonderful moment in the film. We hear the dialogue in the trailer, but it's the scene where he is describing to Susan Sarandon how he observes her when she takes her lemon baths at night to ward off all the fishy smell in the restaurant where she works in the casino, right? The but opening scene. I'm sorry? The opening scene. Exactly. and then, But then later on when they're together, he he's explaining to her how he always he watches her and the camera is moving in very slowly to him and that's that's a very effective I think I think we have to give their trailer department at least a couple of points for the amount of narrative that they were able to squeeze into that trailer even if it's a little strikes us as a little convoluted maybe today a absolutely and I would be very curious to hear what our cinematography expert Daniel Cahill has to say about Atlantic City once again, given the brevity of pre-production time and this rush into production that was necessary due to the Canadian money, how do you think the results look, Dan? Interesting question. Um, I am going to be highlighting not necessarily the photography in this film, which I do not think is particularly outstanding, but how Louis Malle deploys the camera for pure visual storytelling, aside from what I think is one of the great scripts by John Gare, um, Mal's best work is not when he's filming the dialogue. So I'll get into that in a moment. Let me just call up my slides here. There we are. Um, one of the first things you see in the movie is the lemons being sliced. And people tend to remember the lemons in this movie as much as anything else. And I have to say, there's certainly a very erotic element in how they're so full of juice and the, the knife sliding into them is, is very sensual in its own way. Um, speaking of sensuality, this is one scene that I will highlight photographically. Somebody, probably the director, was madly in love with Susan Sarandon and wanted her to look as good as possible. 
I love the way her hair is both front and back lit. And that lovely shaded lamp on the left behind the curtain, the overall composition of the shot, it's really a lovely piece of work. Um, ordinarily, I profile the director of photography, but Richard Chupka here has, he's Canadian, which is why he's filming the, why he's shooting it. Um, we understand that from our prologue today. Um, I couldn't find any other major works by him except that he did photograph a TV film for Claude Chabrol, but that happened later. Um, the first thing we see, as we have mentioned, after the credits is the destruction of this hotel, which Gary tells us happened like seven or eight years before the film was shot. This represents one of the major themes of the story, which is decay and then regeneration or rebirth. And we're going to see that in some of the characters, in particular with Lancaster's character. But this sort of sets the tone. Um, this is another establishing shot that tells us uh, that Robert Joy is about to steal the dope that's being dropped in the phone booth. Now, I have to confess, I have never ever visited Philadelphia, but it's pretty easy to spot here because of the landmark Independence Hall in the background. What I imagine is that they didn't just happen to find this phone booth on the right corner, but they found the corner first and then plopped the phone booth down there as a giant prop. This is another establishing shot telling us a lot about this casino, which is kind of an important location. We probably spent as much time there as we do, except maybe for some of their homes. Um, in it, you learn that they have a trio of lady singers. We also have a leggy waitress serving drinks. And we see Dave and Chrissy entering in the background. And one other thing we note is that this is not a James Bond style tuxedo and evening gown casino. This is where people go dressed in their ordinary leisure clothes, which is probably the way it works right now and in the present day. I'm not able to advance my screen. What is going on here? Let me try something else. There we are. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is Lou's view from his window through all important Venetian blinds. And we see the boardwalk and most importantly, a bulldozer representing the tearing down of what this city once was in its former grandeur. Here is another establishing shot with no dialogue. And it begins in one take, it begins one floor up as we see Lou exiting his apartment. And he comes down these stairs, passes Robert Joy's Dave, and then he goes into the apartment beneath him where he provides breakfast for this lady, Grace. Now, he has offered to make her Hessian eggs, whatever those are. <laughs> you really do learn a lot about somebody when you see them drinking for breakfast. That tells you something about their state of mind and health. Robert Joy, without dialogue, stealing the wallet from his wife's bag. We know this guy is an opportunist. Now he's an exploiter as well. Um, sorry, need to back up one. Uh, another establishing shot, the geography of Lou walking down the boardwalk on his way to do his numbers route. And who should appear behind him but his neighbor, the pretty lady he likes to watch. And he notes it. And then he sees where she goes to her job at the casino. Decay, another motif of the film. This tells you you really don't want to visit Atlantic City right now. This is the exterior of the building where Lou and Sally and now Dave and Chrissy are residing. More decay. Atlantic City looks like a very dreary place. I kind of feel sorry for Lou having to work in this environment. And you look at that building and say, someone actually lives there? 
<clears throat> this is an interesting scene. Um, the Venetian blinds are an important prop here, not as they are in film noir used to cast shadows on an interior, but this reminds us that this is the same window through which Lou has been observing Dave's wife, Dave being next to him, cutting his cocaine with baby laxative, I think. I don't know, never used the stuff. I kind of like this shot. It's typical of how Mal tries to connect things in the, in the mise-en-scene. Uh, we have just spent some time with Sally getting some French lessons via the tape recording that Monsieur Piccoli has loaned her. And then the camera very smoothly pans right and tilts down to Bert and Robert Joy having a stroll. And here is where Lancaster delivers my favorite line from the movie, you should have seen the Atlantic Ocean in those days. It was really something. Tells you a lot about where, where Lou's mind is in 1979. Louis Mall can direct most anything, including a frantic chase scene. And here's a shot just to remind us of that. <clears throat> Here is a moment to pause and think about the way Mal uses close-ups. Not close-ups for dialogue, but close-ups for reactions. And he holds on them for longer than people usually do. This one went at least 20 seconds. And we're watching Lou react to seeing Dave's body being loaded into the ambulance. And he holds on these things. He also holds for a long time on Sally's looking down at her dead husband on the gurney in the hospital. These are important pensive moments that he wants us to study. I love this shot. This tells you volumes about the partnership that Chrissy and Grace have formed overnight. I love the way Grace's hand is gently resting on Chrissy's head. And of course, Chrissy's hand is gently resting on Grace's thigh. It's just a wonderful warm shot. I really love it. Another shot that I love, once again, precious little dialogue going on, but we learn a lot about Lou and how he likes to manage his life. His buddy Al here, the guy in room 307, is trying to get friendly with him, teasing him about his nickname being Medicare. And Lou is kind of in a no-nonsense mood and he just politely, smoothly, gently, shoves Al out of the way so he can be on, on his way. Here is another one of those long held close-ups. This being Lou's humiliation after he is unable to protect Sally when the thugs come after them. This shot is when he declares himself to be Sally's lover. And I'm going to come back to this afterwards with an anecdote. Uh, so remember this shot, we will refer to it later. <clears throat> Here is the first sign of Lou's rebirth, his renaissance as a real gangster. He has just killed two guys, which is the acme of his career. Now, Sarandon doesn't quite know how to react to this, clearly, but it's a moment of elegance for Lou, and we kind of share that joy with him, perverse as it may be. Another shot that I really love is Lou watching Sally steal a lot of cash from his wad. He's looking through the, the crack in the door and there's something lovely about his, the look in his eye and on his face. It's as if he's understanding that this means she will be departing from him and he's accepting it. And he's already starting to plan his future. I couldn't resist showing a shot of Susan Sarandon driving a car. 11 years later, she's going to be cast as a woman named Louise, also <laughs> driving a car, very importantly. We're at the end of the film now and we see Lou's renaissance and Grace's renaissance as well. They're clearly moving off to a better place with money in their pockets. And the camera pans with them a little bit and leaves us on this final shot. Now, 
it, the, the Derek there is wielding a wrecking ball on the old building. I'm going to be optimistic and say that the naked structure on the right is a newer building going up. At least I'd like to read that into it. And that's all I got, folks. Um, I hope I've left you with a better sense of Louis Mal as a very visual filmmaker who knows how to tell a story with just a shot or a tableau. Very much so. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan. I, I had another memory coming out of that <clears throat> Atlantic sc uh, City screening back in the day. My same friend said to me, the happy ending was very risky. I said, what do you mean? He said, because in a story like this, the character is supposed to go deeper and deeper into some terrible situation that they can't get themselves out of. Yet it does end in a in a, in a very upbeat, in a, a positive way for Lou and for the Kate Reed character as well. Even though we do see the demolition going on in the background. Exactly. You know, there's a balance between, as I said, destruction and rebirth, and that's what Atlantic City was going through. I'm not sure it was born as a better place necessarily, but um, you know, there was reason for some optimism back then. Mal was saying that the, the Lou character was a challenge because he had to be touching and funny and desperate and also a ruin of a man who has seen better days. But because of Burt Lancaster's image, Lancaster could play that part and have the audience entirely in his, on his side. But that the challenge came, and this was not only during the directing stage, but during the editing stage, where they had to either discourage or remove the Lancaster grin whenever possible. That powerful smile, Mal tried to downplay that in the editing. It, well, this, it surfaces is perfect, occasionally. this is a perfect segue to the anecdote that I want to share mm -hmm. from Kate Buford's wonderful biography of Burt Lancaster, which is now about 20 years old. And <clears throat> I will just read you, uh, this is about that scene when Lou was on the stairs. One observer thought there was a whiff of condescension from Mal toward Lancaster, a scent the actor would have picked up immediately. Although he was working with a European director, he had to play not a powerful leopard, but an American character he felt he knew from his own real life and screen life better than anyone on the set. There's a moment in the script, recalled Gare, where Pasco yells out, I'm a lover, not a gangster. And Bert was playing the part like Cyrano de Bergerac to the balcony. Louis said, you have to trim it down. You can't do this. And Bert said in front of the crew, who knows more, me or you? And gave a performance that was over the top. Louis then said he wanted something else. And Bert said, OK, we'll do it the way the little froggy wants it. And then we'll do it the way it should be done. He threw the performance away at Louis with contempt. The throwaway was what Mal really wanted, and he continued on more than one take, unbeknownst to Lancaster, to run the camera after he'd called cut and before the next action. As the shoot galloped on, Lancaster realized the director was right and began to loosen into Pasco. Yet when the time came to shoot the scene in which he reveals to Sarandon that he watches her from his window each evening as she washes herself with lemons and in the telling seduces her with the passion of his attention and the spell of his voice, Sarandon ran smack into the wall of the star's presence at its most monolithic. Quote, it was very, very difficult for him to understand, to embrace initially, that she gave herself to him, she recalled. He saw it as him pretty much taking her clothes off and taking her, unquote. So that's a consequence <laughs> of casting an old guy with old values and old styles to play an old guy, but to try and do it with newer styles. And, and but there's another there's another clash taking place, not only generational, but its approaches to acting, because because. Lancaster was more the old school actor, but Sarandon, according to one account I read, had more of a method approach at the time to her performance. So that led to tensions during the rehearsal stage and presumably the production stage. So fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And 
it says says something about Lancaster's temper or temperament on the set that he really felt he was in charge rather than the little froggy. So well, that must have been a very combustible situation because my one encounter with Louis Mal in the film business, I would say his behavior was quite condescending. In a in a conversation with my uh, uh, late boss and I, we were trying to renegotiate. Uh, the distribution rights from Murmur of the Heart in the United States. This would have been like in the late 1980s or so. And it was not successful because I think Mr. 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 Ma kind of looked down on entities of the world like the smaller film distributors or those he perceived to be such. So mm -hmm. I, I can see exactly where that's coming from and how it must have been a fairly, I think combustible was the word, uh, uh, period on the set from time to time. It's... <sighs> When these egos come cl clash or work together, it, it's amazing the films get finished at all without total warfare. Uh, but I, I can't imagine what an actor has to go through because it's you're you're very you're very exposed in front of not only the camera but the crew, and what a director has to go through dealing directing a legend. I I can't imagine the, the pressures that come with that. Well, he spoke excellent English, Louis Ma. That probably was some kind of a, yes. an assist in a, in a situation like that. Yes. Unlike other, other French directors that we know. No, his English was very, very strong. And, and this was a, a film that, that actually found an audience. I mean, it wasn't a huge success, but it, it certainly had a bit of a respectable art house following for, yeah. for a while major Oscar nominations, Best Picture, Director, Screenplay, Big and five. Lancaster and Sarandon. So didn't win any of them, but hey, I was rooting for it. And, and John Gare, he was not a prolific screenwriter. He had written a great favorite of mine a decade earlier. It was Milos Forman's first American film. He had, co he had collaborated on that script with other writers, Taking Off. Right. A generation comedy that that Foreman made in New York, and and really there weren't a lot of film credits between that and and Atlantic City. And then it's another decade, more than another decade later, he will be working on the screenplay or writing the screenplay for F Fred Skepsi's Six Degrees of Separation. So when he wrote, boy, Very he underrated wrote this, Australian uh, director. Yes, the 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 Australian filmmaker. So it's when he when he wrote these were fascinating films. I just wish he did more of them, more well, screenplays. Here's here's just an example. Um, I happen to personally have a treasure trove of screenplays, both those that are published and those that we used to buy off the street. I remember them well. Yeah, <laughs> and I said to myself, "Do I have Atlantic City?" And I went searching all through every shelf, and I not only do I not have it, but it's never been published which is kind of an oversight, I would think. There's probably some rights issue going on there. I don't know, maybe the fact that it was a Canadian film would stand in the way, but. You've touched on a very sensitive nerve here. The fact that the, the entertainment industry protects scripts more than the armed forces do military plans. Getting access to screenplays, uh, shooting scripts, earlier drafts of screenplays before the production began, is virtually impossible. You have to go to an archive that may have a few copies on, on the premises. You have to have contacts in the studio. They keep these things under lock and key and they make it so hard for us to try to analyze the writing. It would be fascinating to know what was it like, what was Atlantic City like on, on, the, on the printed page when, when Gare wrote it? Well, and I'll how did it evolve? I'll give you a difference from that quote that I just read from John Gare about the line that uh, Bert was delivering, I'm not a gangster, I'm a lover. Mm -hmm. He didn't read it that way in the, in the final film. He was responding to the taunt from the Grace character, Kate Reed. She's yelling at him, you're just an old man. And he says, I'm her lover. And there's no mention of I'm not a gangster. So Clearly, unless he just plumb forgot, Gare was quoting an earlier draft of his script. But the other thing is, once a script gets published, I mean, really in, in book form and out there in a bookstore, 
all it really is is a transcription of the final cut of the film. What Not we call a continuity script, it almost yeah, appears. Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, it's still nice to have, um, but we all are curious to know what the first draft looked like, and we may never know, but. And, and it's, it's, that's why, well, we're opening up a hornet's nest of, but yes, yeah. I have always felt that the screenwriting aspects of film are almost impossible to teach because we don't have access to all these different drafts of scripts. So in a film like Atlantic City, it would help not only to have the shooting script, but the original draft and then the subsequent revisions they made because Mal said to Wallace Shawn that because they didn't have a lot of time before filming, there was a lot of improvisation and writing occurring during production. And he didn't like working that way, but because of the deadlines, that's how they worked with Atlantic City. Better than not making the film at all. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Uh, anything else to uh, to add? I, I know we, we probably have people out there who would like, who have some questions or some thoughts about Atlantic City. I will brief, I will bring our, and I would also love to hear any thoughts she might want to share with us about the film as well. Laurie Turchin, anything to add to Atlantic City before you give us some ideas about our next talk back? Um, you know, one of the things that really struck me is that Burt Lancaster in the movie only almost becomes like a metaphor for Atlantic City. You know, we see his decline and then his rebirth and um I, I just thought it was a great performance um and, and i just think that he's so aligned with the city that um it's very it's a very touching movie you know um his relationship with cookie and you know pinza and and i just i i think there's just so many parallels between the lives of him and cookie and and even susan sarandon you know um uh, her life you know she has to have a rebirth too now because she her dream is kind of gone because of what happened in atlantic city so um i, I love this film and just as an extension of that thought, my, the favorite line I cited about you should have seen the Atlantic Ocean, he's really talking about himself and his yeah. life. You should have seen me back in the day. I was really something. That's what he's saying. Yeah, exactly. They heard my name. They respected me. It's I mean, that, that kind of a, that idea. Well, yeah. And 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 her her husband's performance in the movie is just so brilliant. You know, he's just such a little weasel and like, yeah, you know, I got your name in Vegas. And, you know, he just totally feeds into that ego of him. And, you know, and, and you know, she also obviously kind of likes the bad boys, you know, like she didn't flee Burt Lancaster when he killed two guys. You know, personally, that would have freaked me out a little bit. She didn't seem to freak out nearly as much, you know. So quite um, the contrary. Exactly, exactly. You know, so you know, kind of like in uh breathless, you know, when she she knows he's a killer, she knows he's married and, and an adulterer, and yet she's still there. So, you know, I, I think us women have a reputation of going for the bad boys, you know. And uh as men do going I was just going to girl. say, us men are not exactly innocent in that regard either. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I did want to remind everyone, if they have a question or thought about the film, please hit your reaction button and raise your hand so I can call on you. And um, Lori, our next talk back is going to be in, two, in a few weeks. Stand by for that. Funny you should ask. <laughs> um, there you go. So um, on Sunday, November 2nd, oh, no, that, sorry, that's Wednesday, November 2nd, my bad, um, at three o'clock, we'll have uh, Max's lecture on Scorsese and De Niro, which, I don't, Max, have you ever seen the um, Don Rickles thing with him and De Niro having like a, a drink or dinner? Don I'm Rickles good. did a show right before he died. And he, like he sat down with Snoop Dogg, and there's one with him and Scorsese and De Niro that is just hilarious, just hilarious. So I'm gonna look for that. Thank you for mentioning that, Laurie. I'm gonna look for that. that is. They must be laughing from start to finish, or at least Scorsese. Oh my, 
best. Oh, movie. it's it's phenomenal. It's it's yeah. definitely worth worthy of watching. And then of course on Sunday, November sixth, we'll have the talk back the new the uh, the King of Comedy from four p.m. to five fifteen p.m. So again, the lecture on Scorsese and De Niro is Wednesday, November second. My bad on the typo. So um, with no further ado, Edward, um, do you want to um, unmute your video, uh, audio, and start your video? Edward? Uh, yes, uh, it's not right. letting me start. It's we not letting you. me start. We heard you for a minute. While Edward is, is is working on the sound. Someone had, had, one, had pointed out that in the restaurant scene with, with Lancaster and Sarandon, you, uh, the waiter is Wallace Shawn. Mm, so that's, yeah. uh, yes, Edward, go right ahead. You're still muted, Edward. Unmute. Uh, so we can see, there you go. There you are. Okay, hi, great, Edward. good, 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 hi, hi. Uh, technology, thank you for another great lecture. I really like the, the tag team, the back and forth, it's really great. Uh, question though about the music. Why why did um, Mal uh, not uh, he chose not to use Legrand's score and went to source music uh, instead? I'm just curious about that. Does that I'm trying to remember the bio if the biographies mention anything about that. Oh no, I'm you you you'd mentioned a Lancaster biography. N not sure why why that decision was made. It's not the first time that that, that it's not a, it's not the first time, nor is it unusual when that happens. We have cases where a score is written and then the, the director decides to use source music or classical music, which is what happened with 2001 A Space Odyssey. Alex North had written a score and Kubrick decided to go with the temporary music tracks, which were the classical music. I don't know unless you the other three. I was going to say must have been, must have been some fireworks because Michelle <laughs> Legrand was a man of no small ego either. Well, here's the thing too. This was also a time when movie soundtracks became a revenue stream for the studios. So the, rather than perhaps risk it on a new score, why not use uh, songs that already exist and um, that might be, you know, it might have been cheaper. It might have been a way to draw more people in to see it because this was a time when movie theaters were sort of not doing super well. So they were just coming back with the Hollywood Renaissance. So that that would be my guess. I had I read that. Imagine. Go ahead. I had read that. I had I just quick. I had read that uh, Mal had commissioned Ron to write a score, which he did, he turned in. And then for some reason, he didn't use it. And I, I've not been able to understand why. So that's why I asked the question. I don't have the answer, except that once once again, it's not, this does happen on occasion where a score is commissioned that I can only imagine how frustrating that would be for the composer to spend all this time, even though, even if you get paid to write a score only to have the director change his or her mind at the last minute. And I don't editing. know the answer to this, but I'm wondering if I don't think there was ever a soundtrack album from this film ever released. I could be wrong, but it doesn't ring a bell with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Does anyone else have any other questions? I don't see any hands up. Well, I'll put a question out to everybody. Okay. <laughs> does the does the shift in mood uh, affect anyone in a negative way? Because I was way too young to be reviewing this for a newspaper when it came out, but they they assigned it to me. And I did not have a lot of time between seeing the movie and going to the newspaper office to write the review. And I'm this young kid who barely can write. And I was not able to articulate what it was about Atlantic City that was not gelling for me. And I, I think it was in re-watching the film this week, it was the shift in tone, which didn't work for me, but others may feel otherwise. And once again, I go back to something I mentioned earlier, how we were cutting away from the two principals to the two women, and that's almost like a comic subplot. And then we go back to Bert and Susan. 
did that work for everybody? Was it distracting? Is it just me? Well, I think it's interesting that Cookie spends that whole, like, I thought Cookie couldn't walk, you know? You mean Grace? And then all of a sudden, a uh, Grace, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, can you call her Cookie? No, Cookie was her husband. Oh, right, 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 right. Uh, Grace, Cookie's I'm widow. Sorry. Um, okay. I knew a woman named Cookie growing up. But anyway, um, you know, and then like she almost has a rebirth. Like we don't see her leave the bed till almost the end of the movie. You know, I, I you know, I just figured she was ill <laughs> and, you know, <clears throat> They all, you know, I was in Atlantic City right when it started, like maybe a year or two after this movie. And I got to tell you, once you were off the boardwalk, it was still pretty disgusting, you know. <laughs> um, so, but I, I kind of, you know, I thought it was interesting that because he was an old man, no one even thought to suspect him, you know. Um, I thought that was sort of an interesting commentary on society and that he could get off relatively scot-free because of that. Um, but um, I, I, you know, I felt like everyone kind of got what they wanted at the end, you know? And I, for one, had no objection to the shifts in tone. I mean, this came after the 70s Renaissance where yeah. Altman could film The Long Goodbye with shifts of tone every five minutes. And that worked for me. And I guess maybe my mind was more open to this kind of style by 1980. I'm just putting it out there that it seemed fine to me. I appreciated the, the variation. Because the, the humor, sometimes it could be a little much, like there was a scene at the bus station where the comedy seemed a little jarring. It just seemed out of place with the other par portions of the film. But then uh, you had little marvelous subtle touches like the, was it the DeGrasse funeral home? We understand. I mean, uh, it, it's a wonderfully subtle bit of humor there. Yeah. These were just my reactions. I, I should interject. I just got a text from my friend Lou Brothers who has helped us with musical references mm -hmm. in the past. And he says, there was an Atlantic City soundtrack album released in 1981. It's available on CD and LP from Amazon. So those of you who love your vinyl, order it up right now. Well, then that take a look at what the track listing was on that. Yeah. Yeah. And that would make sense because that was another way for them to make money off of sure. what they probably didn't think was going to be a great box office. You know, maybe. I don't know. This was a case where Paramount Pictures didn't drop the ball on a smaller film. They were known for not knowing what to do with smaller pictures around this time. They would open it in the market, and then if it didn't do blockbuster business, they would just, just toss it away, and it would never reach the rest of the country. But Atlantic City, they perhaps were encouraged by some of the reviews, and they, they did give it a chance. And the President Oscar of the company at that time. I'm sorry. A guy named Frank Mancuso, and I think he he was he used, he liked to give attention to smaller pictures. That same year, uh, Gallipoli, the film that kind of you know one of the mm -hmm. films that introduced Mel Gibson to America, that was a par Paramount gave that a push as well, and it was it was mm -hmm. successful. You need somebody in the sales department who cares about these things. So. Yeah. Well, you know, that was what's so great about the moguls is even though so many of them, you know, ruled with an iron fist, they all seem to have a, a nash for entertainment. And, you know, um, you know, I still hope and pray that there are people like that in Hollywood today, because some some good quality films do get made. Unfortunately, they're, you know, rare and few and far between. I just can't imagine how it must have been for a director like Louis Malle to go from the European system of production where the money comes together and the director is pretty much left alone to the Hollywood system where there, it's much more micromanaged. And when he did do his ill-fated film Crackers after Atlantic City and My Dinner with Andre, he had to deal with three different regime changes at the same studio and all sorts of studio bureaucracies that he might he would not have had to deal with overseas but it takes a tough director to, to be able to navigate all that so yeah i think we're out of time but i i just wanted to thank uh, everyone for participating today and i will turn the proceedings over to 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 sean and laurie and others uh, 
from New Plaza Cinema. Sorry about that. No, no, I like, go ahead, put that back up. That's great. Um, I, that's that's all I wanted to do was just remind everyone of what we have coming up. So it's um, Wednesday, November 2nd. I think this is going to be incredible, Scorsese and uh, De Niro, and then followed by the discussion of the King of Comedy. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun with that one too. This was great, you guys. I mean... Okay. I, I just, between the lecture of mm -hmm. Louis Mall and, and this discussion, I just learned a ton. How do I get Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, thanks everyone, for, for putting up with me in the projection booth. We'll try to be more picturesque <laughs> next time. Look Good luck at the theater, Gary. Gary. And please come to our theater, everybody. Yes. Good, good day, everyone. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye.